different as we begin here because this is the last day of Pastor Appreciation Week, and so um, I'm actually going to take a selfie with all of you guys because um, there's a there's a thing on the pension fund, which is our denominational, you know, like retirement thing for pastors, and they're they're doing um, this hashtag thing where they want you to take a picture of you and your ministry set. And so I'm going to get all of you guys in it with me. So I'm going to go like this. Why don't you guys come over here too? This is Ian Hutney. Um, we're going to go like this. You guys make sure you're good. Okay, ready? One, two, three. All right, I think it works. Cool, thank you. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Um, <laughs> but good morning, it's good to see you all here. Um, just a couple of quick little announcement things. Um, We've got, you, you kind of have, you see the little thing in your bulletin here. Um, this is the Thanksgiving dinner that happens every year. Um, and this may, hopefully not, but may end up being the last year that this happens. Because um, Jack and, and Mary Zarbaninsky are, are going to be quitting after this year. And so, um, but it is happening this year. So you've got the flyer there. And I'll probably put the flyer out again in November. But I wanted to get it out to you early enough so that you had it and you can kind of plan for it if you want or if you can. Um, but we, um, they need volunteers. And also, we just need to get the word out because the location has changed. Charlie's Diner no longer wants to do it at their location. And so they are, they've changed the location to the Senior Junction, which is down by the cemetery down here. Um, and so that's where it's going to be this year. And I don't know how well that will get, the word will get around for that. So I'm trying to get this out a little bit early so that if you know anybody that does participate in it or needs to be, needs to go to it or for whatever reason may need a, a call-in meal or whatever, we can um, let people know ahead of time or at least try to give as much advance warning as possible because I'm kind of guessing that people will show up at Charlie's that day and it will not be there. So um, just trying to get the word out a little bit sooner this year. But that is there. So hang on to that. And I'll, I'll put this out again, like I said, in November when it gets a little closer as well. But this is just to help give a heads up. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is that we've got the, the trunk or treat coming up and, in the Rupert Square. That's going to happen um, on Monday, which is not, so excuse me, not this Monday, but the 31st on Halloween night. And it's 630 to 9. And we, as a church, host a booth. So if you're able to come and volunteer and help us out with that, that'd be awesome. We're trying to kind of put together a booth that's going to look like a cathedral theme and have them walk in and maybe wear choir robes or something. I'm not sure yet, but um, something to that effect. But if you can come and, and volunteer and be a part of that, that'd be awesome. Um, we are probably going to see somewhere around 5,000 people walk through that square. So it's going to be quite an event um, and quite a spectacle. I don't know. It's going to be quite a thing. So... Um, I think that's it, though, for now. Lunch. Oh, I did put it on there. Um, the holiday lunch, we're planning on... Uh, did I put it on there? I think I did. Um, the holiday lunch is on there. It's it's on the 10th of December, so that's you know really far ahead here, but we're just kind of looking to it in the future. Most churches do um, some kind of harvest dinner, and with so many churches doing it, it just kind of feels like we can never find a time when no one else was doing it. So we decided to kind of change it up a little bit and go between Thanksgiving and Christmas, just call it a holiday dinner or a lunch. Excuse me, we're doing it as lunch. So it's on a Saturday, um, and we're just going to do a couple different types of soups and some cinnamon rolls, maybe some regular rolls and a salad or two. So if you can be a part of that or want to help with that, that is encouraged as well. But that's just kind of something to look forward to because it's almost two months away. So that is happening as well. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, yeah. The reason why I wanted to talk about it now is that we are going to have, like, the bizarre tables. Oh, that's right. And so if you want to start making crafts and things now, sure. Yeah, we're doing the lunch and kind of a mini bazaar. So if you, you know, the, everything's kind of to just raise some funds for things. And so. Yeah. So if you have any crafts that you like to do or that you know someone else likes to do that would be willing to. To, to be a part of that or donate that, um, start thinking about that now. Um, we're probably going to have a couple of different things. I know we're going to do some baked goods too, like some Bethany always makes these really big cookies and stuff that we sell for like a dollar. Um, just some different things that we can also just kind of 
use as partially a fundraiser as well. So be thinking about that. Okay, let's go ahead and pray and start this morning. Lord, <clears throat> we come before you today with, with humble hearts and we ask that you would that you would not only just be present, but that we would feel your presence today. That the Holy Spirit would just uh, shower over each and every one of us as we worship and, and pray to you today. Lord, help mold and guide and shape and lead each and every one of us to be the disciples that you are calling us to be. Lord, in the, in the church that you have in store for us here in this Mid-Cash area. We just thank you and we praise you. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you can stand with us, we're going to open with a hymn called How Great Thou Art. And if you want, you can open it in your hand all number 30.
psalm this morning comes from Psalm 121. If I can get to it, there we go. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your coming and your going in from this time on and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this time, um, as always, we, we come to our joys and concerns and prayers of the people. And um, we've got uh, this in, in your bulletin that we continue to try to update and keep current. And we hope that, you know, as it says on here, that you use it in your prayer life at home. That it's something you can take home with you. And when you do pray, you've got this list. You've got this thing that you know is happening um, with those that we know and love. And the things that we are trying to just be in prayer for. And that you can just be prayer warriors at home. And so... Um, we continue to pray for all these things here. And I wanted to mention real quick, you know, Johnny and Fahama, we've been praying for them because, um, Fahama, or excuse me, Johnny was pregnant and, um, the baby was born this week. As you can see up here, um, I think it's pronounced Aziza. So Aziza June Kibambazi. Um, she was born October 12th, 725, weighing nine pounds, 14 ounces, 23 inches long. So, um, yes, it's a it's an awesome thing to celebrate. There's a couple other pictures too, um, and then Fahamu with the baby and and I'm I'm in I'm talking with them right now about them coming to visit us um, before they end up going to Africa, um, and I don't know exactly when that what that's going to look like yet. You know, baby was just born, and um, so but they are they are eventually going to be going back to Africa, um, and I just don't know exactly when they're planning on that, but we're going to try to get them here because I know that you guys would all love to see the baby too. And, and they want to be able to share in that with us because we've been supporting them through these years. And so um, just a neat thing, just an awesome thing, a, a praise definitely um, to be thanking God for. So, but we also pray for, um, you know, the other churches, the other ministries in our area, you know, this week we're going to be doing the superfood giveaway, which is, you know, on there. And uh, we, you know, we try to help out with that as much as we can. So if you guys want to come and volunteer, that's awesome. You know, we're up to, um, I just got another ID. So I think we're up to 26 food boxes that, um, that we are delivering that, you know, that, that we go and we help volunteer, but we actually deliver um, to people who, you know, f first of all, we deliver it to Syringa Plaza Apartments that has um, several people there that, you know, it's hard for them to get to the, the food giveaway. And so we do deliver there. And there's a couple other people um, that we bring food boxes to as well. And so that number is just building. And it's a really cool thing to be a part of. And so um, if it's something you want to be a part of as well, let me know. Um, or you can drive around with me and help me deliver, whatever you want to do. So, um, But that's happening this Tuesday. So in a couple of days here. Um, and that's at 9 o'clock. And we, we also want to be praying for all of the people here that are on this list. You know, we I try to keep this as up-to-date as possible. So if you see someone on here that maybe doesn't need to be on here in the same way or um, things, circumstances have changed something, please let me know. Um, but we just continue to pray for all of these things um, and also have this opportunity to, to shout out any new ones or something that needs to be changed at this time as well. And we're still praying for all those that are sick, right, Briley? Yeah. We're still praying for all the sick people. Are there any other any others? Elizabeth, do you have one? What? We can keep praying about that. Yeah, absolutely. You have one, Brayden? What? Yes, we know. Okay. We may have to have a talk about that. Um, yes, we know. We're still praying about that. Okay. Do you have one, Donovan? What's up? Yeah, we should definitely pray for Olivia's head. You know, Olivia was playing on the trampoline yesterday. She, she fell and cut her head open. And we went to the um, urgent care, I think is where you guys went, right? 
and we, we were able to just glue it shut because it was a small enough cut, huh? So we just pray that that heals really well. Yeah, they went to the doctor. Yep. Okay. Are there any others? Oh, yeah, for anyone. Okay. What's the what's going on? Okay. Well, that's okay. I will. That's a good thing. Good things are happening. Okay. Um, is there any on there that you see? Elaine, Elaine Frederick, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> oh, man, they are, um, they are some strong people. I know, I know, absolutely. Don and Elaine. Okay. 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 I hadn't heard about it yet, so. Um, David, did you have one? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, she, she's sick, I guess. Yeah, she's not feeling good. <coughs> Excuse me. Brayden, is it important? What is it? <laughs> yes, we well we're we're definitely thankful for for Briley being born, huh? Because he's celebrating his birthday today. Or it, it is is it actually today? No. Oh, it was Tuesday, but we're celebrating it today. Okay. Yeah, Elizabeth. I need I know. Oh, pray for the cops that died. Yeah, that is a good thing to pray for. You know, it's we have it on here for all the police and the firefighters and emergency personnel and everybody that's dealing with stuff. And you know, there's a big windstorm that happened over kind of on the coast. And so there's a lot of people that are in need over there too. So, okay, well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer unless somebody else has something else. But let's go ahead and do that. If you would please pray with me. Lord, we come before you and we're so thankful so thankful for our kids and for all of the wonderful things that happen you know with with babies being born and um people being healed and 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 you just continuing to show yourself in so many different ways and situations and in and through each and every one of us as well Lord, we are so thankful we know all good things come from you and so we praise you for it but lord we also come together because you have said you've called for us to bear one another's burdens to pray for each other. And so we do that today. We lift up all these things, Lord, that have been written down, the things that have been spoken aloud, and especially those things that are still written on our hearts that maybe we haven't told anybody about, or those things that are just um, burning up inside of us and we're just not ready to let them go. Lord, we want to practice trusting in you. And so we give all those things to you today. We lay our worries and our burdens down, Lord, and we're going to try not to pick them back up when we leave. Lord, we just ask for your promises to be fulfilled. That you would provide the encouragement that we need, the strength that we may need, the peace that can pass all understanding. Lord, even the healing. We know that you have promised to walk with us. And so we demand that you do. We demand that your presence be felt for each and every person here and that we are praying for. And so we come together to pray as this family that is gathered the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, let the children come to me, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And as the kids come forward, we're going to go ahead and sing, Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Hey, buddy. All right, guys. Set that there. Braden, can you sit down, please? Okay, so today, today, you guys, we're talking about somebody that I know that you guys talked about in Sunday school. Have you guys all heard of David? Yes, you have. We, you, Mom has talked with, about David with you in Sunday school. Can someone tell me who David is? Anybody? Who's David? What? The one with a slingshot? The one with a sling? Like a slingshot? It was actually not, not exactly like a slingshot. It was kind of two or possibly four ropes and a little pouch. And he would swing it over his head and he'd let one side go. And it would, a rock would go flying and hit something that he was aiming at. And they called it a sling. It hit Goliath in the head. That's absolutely right. Yeah, Elizabeth, you have something else? Um, uh, and um, uh, David killed Goliath. That's very true. And Briley, you have something? <coughs> okay, no. Um, what? What is it? Uh, some firemen died. No, okay. Hold on. Let's let's get back into the story here. <clears throat> um, so David, he did kill Goliath. But what else did David David do? What? <clears throat> you know what he did? Uh, no. No. Okay. Do you know what else he did? He's been king. He was king. That's right. You know, David was um, one of only a couple of kings that actually did good things for the country. You have a question? What? No, Brayden. Okay. No more of that, okay? Okay? All right. Um, so what can we learn from David, you guys? What do you guys, what do you think David teaches us? To be good? Well, sure, yeah. David's story does does help teach us that we should be good, huh? So we should listen to God. One of the things that we're going to talk about today with David is how much faith David had. How much faith David had in God. He believed that what God said was true, right? And because he believed that what God said was true, David did Great, amazing things, didn't he? He killed a giant. You know, he also killed lions. And with his sling. And David with rocks. And David also became king. Probably the most prosperous king that Israel ever had. And he also got to be in the lineage of of Jesus. Did you know that? And he got to do a lot of those things because he believed that what God said was true. Huh? Right, Brayden? And so I hope my encouragement today for you guys is that sometimes, you know, our Sunday school teachers or our parents or somebody tells us something about God, and sometimes it's hard to, to listen to that or to follow it. But my hope for you guys is that you guys you guys learn from David, and you learn that when God says something, he means it, and that when we believe in the things that God has in store for us, when we believe in God, great things can happen, awesome things, okay? Okay? Okay. Let's go ahead and pray. Ready? 
Lord, we thank you so much for our kids. We thank you for their joy and their energy and their and their grateful hearts. Lord, we we pray that you would continue to place a yearning inside each and every one of them, that they would want to know you more, that you would just show yourself to them, that your Holy Spirit would pour over each and every one of them, and that us as as adults and parents and leaders in their lives, that we would consistently show Jesus to them, that they might learn from, from us, and that they might see your face, because we are, are um, reflecting that to them. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, guys, you have a piece of candy? Just pick one, okay? At this time, I'd like to invite the elder and the deacons to please please come forward. As we come to our time of communion. One of the things that I think people overlook and that I find interesting is that often when we say, you know, let's get together, let's do something, let's hang out. It's usually around a meal. We say, let's go have dinner. Let's have breakfast. Let's have lunch. Let's go for snacks. Let's do something. But it's around some kind of a meal. The reason for that is because something special happens when we eat a meal together. There's a bond that is created. A, 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 some kind of a social phenomenon happens that we actually grow closer together when we share a meal together. And that isn't just true today. It was true back in Jesus' time. It was true in Moses' time. It's just something that happens between human beings when we share a meal together. And Jesus knew this. And so he shared that last supper with his disciples, knowing that, you know, they probably shared many meals together. But he didn't just say, we're just going to have this last supper and that's going to be it. He said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me every time that you gather. And so we do this. We don't do this just to remember Christ, but we do this to connect with Christ in a different way, to connect with each other in a different way because we're sharing a meal together in his presence and with each other. And so I hope that you would prepare your hearts and your minds this morning as people who love and continue to strive to follow Christ. We are all welcome to this table together. Will you please join me in our affirmation of faith as printed above and also in your bulletin. I believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God, and my personal Savior and Lord. Let's pray. Father, please bless us as we partake of your communion. Help us to take this, this opportunity to give you the praise and glory you deserve. In thy name, amen. Amen. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he gave thanks and he broke it saying, this is my body that has been broken for you. Eat of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, This is my blood that has been poured out for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do proclaim my death until I come again. And so we are all welcome to partake in this meal together.
And so now we come to our time of offering. And um, I had told you last week that this week we're going to do also, in addition to our, our normal offering, just a special offering, because we're going to use this money to go and buy candy for the trunk or treat. Um, and, and we do expect to have somewhere closer to like 5,000 people. And um, I'm hoping that we're not going to run out of candy. <laughs> it's going to be a lot. Um, I, we will certainly not be giving 5,000 pieces of candy, I'm sure. But, um, but we want to be able to continue to give candy during the duration that we're there. And so um, we're going to, in addition to taking a special offering today, we're also going to have um, as you'll see when you leave, there's a box back in the back where we're just going to collect candy donations. Whether if it's if it's money that you want to give, you can give it to me. Um, but if it's actual bags of candy, just bring them in, and we'll we'll continue to collect that. And then when we have um, our Halloween night, we'll hopefully have plenty of candy. Maybe we can even help others continue to stay stocked with candy as well. So um, we just give joyfully this morning. And so if you're new, please let the plate pass you by. We're not asking anything of you. We're just simply glad that you're here and worshiping with us. But um, we just ask that the deacons would receive this morning's offering. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for these offerings. Help them to go where they are, will do the most good. Help us to all do our share, whether it is financial or through our time or talents. These things we ask in thy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You got your Bible with you today? I encourage you to grab it. Um, and if you, you know, if you forget or you don't have a Bible, there should be some in the pews in front of you. If they're not enough, I know that there are some in the back. Um, but if you don't own a Bible, we want you to be able to have that for yourself. So take it; it's our gift to you. We want you to be able to have the Word of God with you always, and especially at home. So, but if you've got your Bible, hold it in your hand. Repeat after me: This is my Bible. God's Word written for me. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Within these pages, I will find strength, peace, and love. Today I will be taught the Word of God. So I boldly and fearlessly confess, my mind is prepared, my heart is receptive, and I, I will be changed from the inside out. I'm about to receive the everlasting, the unchanging, the ever-living Word of God. And I declare that I will not be the same. Amen. As I go ahead and open in prayer, um, you can certainly open your Bible up to Hebrews chapter 11. Um, we're also going to look, because we're talking about David today, we're going to look at um, 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 17. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, let flow your words for your glory for your purpose, I ask the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So how many of you think that you could walk on the roof of an airplane in flight at 10,000 feet cruising altitude? Anybody think they could do that? Ken, you're lying. Um, <laughs> but you've, you've never done it, right? You, um, and you also probably believe that you can't because there's, there's some obvious physics happening, right? I mean, 10,000 feet, first of all, you'd probably hardly, hardly be able to breathe. And, and the wind speed and everything, you just wouldn't be able to stay on the plane. But you don't believe that you can do it, and so you don't have any confidence in doing it. But let me ask you this. If I, if I said, how many of you think you could walk on the Great Wall of China if you were there? If you were there. I'm pretty sure all of you could do it. Because people do it. You can walk on the Great Wall of China. But, even though you've never done it, you know that it can be done. You know it's a possibility. Um, there's also no wind speed or things to have happen. But you believe that you can do it. I think most of you do anyway. And so you have confidence to do it. When we believe that something is possible, we can operate in confidence that it can be done. Faith Belief, um, it's something that creates in us confidence. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about another story of faith today, um, David. And, and we've talked about all these other ones. That, you know, we've gone through this, this chapter in Hebrews, and we're almost to the end. We've only got uh, two left. David's one of them. Um, and we talked about Jephthah last week, and Jephthah was kind of an unknown, unheard of character for most people, and that's okay. And it's a hard one. Because, um, you know, he, he makes this vow to, to kill or sacrifice, I should say, the first person that walks out of his tent after the, he defeats the Ammonites, and it happens to be his daughter. And so he ends up offering his daughter up as a burnt sacrifice. And that's a hard story to talk about and to learn from and to even preach about, which is probably why most people haven't heard of Jephthah's story, because most people don't touch it. Um, but we talked about how that story, you know, basically teaches us that having faith in God means loving him more than we love our own family. And I know that sounds very harsh and hard, but that's something that Jesus asked us to do as well. And trusting in him more than we trust ourselves. And that's something we can definitely take away. But today we're going to talk about David. Um, and, and David is a much bigger character to talk about, but let's go ahead and read Hebrews 11, that kind of brings us this name to talk about. It says, And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, who we're talking about today, and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, they administered justice, they obtained promises, they shut the mouths of lions, they quenched raging fire, they escaped the edge of the sword, they won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, and they put foreign enemies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. And they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. And that's our concluding scripture that we're pulling these names from. And David, you know, King David, or David and Goliath, or however you know him, he's probably one of the well, most well-known characters in the Bible. Um, probably second only to Jesus, maybe even, because David is talked about so much even when we talk about Jesus. He's, he's the most famous king of Israel, right? His, his lineage was destined to have the Messiah and the Savior of the world as part of it. He was skillful at playing a liar. And I actually was talking to the youth this morning about what a liar is because um, <laughs> um, it, it sounds like somebody who's a liar, but it's, it's actually an instrument that is similar to a harp. It's got a horseshoe shape to it with a something in the middle that strings come down. And he was very skillful at this. As a young boy, he played the lyre for the king. He was very skillful with it. David also, he killed lions. He killed um, bears or wolves or whatever came to take the sheep. 
that he watched over. And he also killed a massive Philistine named Goliath. All of this he did as a youth. He wrote over half of all the Psalms. His son Solomon, also um, most certainly influenced by David, highly, right? As a son might be, ended up writing all but two chapters of the book of Proverbs. But David also committed adultery and murder, disobeyed God many times. There's many examples and there's a ton of individual stories that we can pull out of David's life, right? Because it, it, we have a ton of it. If you read through, um, there are several, several chapters about David and the things that he did and the things that he should not have done. <laughs> but there's a lot there. And so there's a lot of things I can't just pull on his whole life and say, oh, this is what we should learn from it. So I, had, I have to pick something. And so we're going to address just one of the more famous stories and pieces about David. So if you look in 1 Samuel, we're going to go ahead and read this, this story. It's 1 Samuel 17, and it um, starts in verse 2 that we're going to start at. It says, Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and the Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Goth, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armored with a coat of mail. The weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And... His spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you, or, yeah, why have you come out to draw, why have you not come out to draw for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all, the Israel, and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Aphrodite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three eldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul into battle. The names of his three sons went to the bat, who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, Abinadab and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Jesse said to his son David, Take your brothers uh, an, ephah, or an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See how your brothers fare and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning and he left someone in charge of the sheep took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as an army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Goth, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David finally heard them. All the Israelites, when they saw the man, they fled from him, and they were very much afraid. The Israelites said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him, and will give him his daughter and take his family free in his, or make his family free in Israel. David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? 
For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done for the man who kills him. His eldest brother, Eliab, heard him talking to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down just to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? It was only a question. He turned away from from him towards another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. Now, when the words of David, the words that David had spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant, meaning him, I will go and fight with the Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him for you are just a boy. And he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and I struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. He took them off. And then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, and with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the wild, to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and give it, and I will give the dead, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in the bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down onto the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. And there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, he drew it out of his sheath, and he killed him, and he cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The troops of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout, and they pursued the Philistines as far as Goth and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shariam as far as Goth and Ekron. Ekron, The Israelites came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. He put his armor in his tent. When Saul... When Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. The king said, Inquire whose son the stripling is. On David's return from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, and the head of the Philistine in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the 
the Bethlehemite, if I can say that right, the Bethlehemite. There you go. And that is the conclusion of the piece that we're going to look at. I know that was kind of long, but um, it was all important to, to look at. And you see, David had an amazing confidence in God. I mean, he he not only hears what Goliath says and is like, no, we got to do something about it. He's angry. And when he comes up to the battle line to meet him, he runs quickly toward him. I mean, he's running into the fray, so to speak, with complete confidence in God. And his faith in God caused him to be offended and angry that this Philistine would defy the armies of the living God, as he says. And so, and he knows that, you know, God is not some small thing that we should cower behind this person, right? He's, he's mad. He's like, I can, you know, God's, God's delivered me from lions, from bears, probably from people who came to raid his, his camp to take a sheep or whatever it might be. I mean, he, he has probably done many things to protect his flock as a shepherd. And he's like, I, this guy's nothing. I'm gonna, we can take him on. He actually says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? You know, he's nobody. And he's asking all the soldiers as if to say, why is no one stepping up? How, how have none of you thought the way that I think and just stepped up? So he's angry about this. So David's problem in some ways was that he was naive, right? I mean, he was naive to the, in the worldly sense. He was. He was, he was naive in, in, the, in terms of a, a worldly understanding of who Goliath was and this battle and everything that was happening. He was naive to that, where the soldiers were thinking about themselves and fearing this person. But David was naive to it. You know, all the, um, they've been, the, these soldiers have been fighting and they've been battling. Um, and they see Goliath and they shudder in fear because of his size and, and what they've heard of him doing. And, and they compare that to their own, right? I mean, I was telling um, the youth this morning that the average Israelite, they were not a very big people. You know, the average height for an Israelite was somewhere around 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, and a tall one would be like 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, you know, like that's a tall guy. But Philistines averaged more like 6'2", six, six, average. So all of these guys that they're seeing are bigger than them for the most part. And, and then they see Goliath come in and they're just like, are you kidding me? Like, I can't, we can't do this. Because w- their brain is thinking worldly in a worldly sense, they're, they are they are intimidated by their size compared to, to the, uh, the the enemy's size compared to their own, and they're not thinking um, in terms of God being their protector. And so David was naive to that. He didn't he didn't go, oh, I'm just a boy, I can't take on a lion. He just did it because he knew that God was with him. He was naive to this worldly understanding that that there was some kind of comparison there. And the, all the soldiers were thinking in that way, and so they were afraid. They were definitely afraid. But see, um, David was blind in that way because he compared, let's see, he looked at Goliath in comparison to God, not in comparison to himself. He went, you know what, God is bigger than this. God is bigger than everything. And if, if God is ordaining this, if God is with me, who can stand against me, right? And so that's where his, naive, his naivete was. And Saul says to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight him. You're just a boy, he says. You are just a boy. And he's been a warrior from his youth, this Philistine. And, and it says, when the Philistines looked and they saw, when the Philistine, excuse me, when, when Goliath, the Philistine looked and he sees David and he disdained him, because he, he views him as only a youth as well. Excuse me. And the Philistine says to David, Am I a dog that you would come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by 
his gods, Goliath's gods. He curses David by his gods. See, David was very young at this time. And, and I think that's something that people tend to forget, is that David was a boy. He was not some strapping man who goes against this. I mean, he's a boy. Um, Saul calls him a boy. I mean, even, even the Philistine says that he's a youth. And according to Numbers chapter 1, verses 3, um, he had not yet even reached the age to be part of the army, which was the age of 20. When you were age of 20, you could then be in the army. And I guarantee you that given the opportunity, David would be in that army. Giving his reaction the way that he was, he would be in that army. But he wasn't old enough, so he couldn't be part of it. And we can obviously see that um, that he had, when it says that he was part of eight sons. Jesse had eight, eight sons. And so he has seven, if he's the youngest, he has seven older brothers. And only the oldest three are in the army. So even if you gave a year gap between each one of those sons, assuming that maybe the the oldest one was 20 or 21, probably just 20, David could be as young as 12 in this story. A 12-year-old boy facing this military veteran who was so large and so intimidating that no other person would even go against him. And I think that definitely says even more than just the story implies. There's a verse in the New Testament that we often refer to. It's Matthew 18, verses 2 through 5. I'll just read it real quick. It says, He called a child whom he put among among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. You probably have heard that before, right? It's a very um, common one that is used and talked about. And this verse doesn't mean that we're supposed to pursue this like childish faith, right? Because I think there's a difference between a childish faith and a childlike faith. It's a faith that a child would have. Not that it's childish, but that in some ways it's naive. To the world. See, faith in, in a father or a parent who takes care of them, that's the kind of a faith a child has. Someone who supplies all their needs, who they can rely on for protection, for shelter, for guidance and wisdom. That's the kind of childlike faith we're called to have in the Lord. See, for David, his faith was at a place where he believed that God, or that with God, all things were possible. He lived that. He believed that, that God had chosen Israel, and that, and that he would be with any, anyone who stood against God's enemies. Because God had chosen Israel. His worldly naivety, naivete, however you want to say it, partially due to his age because he had a childlike faith in the Lord. It was his strength. It was the thing that separated him from this entire Israelite army who would not stand for God in front of this enemy. His faith gained him confidence to stand up against a giant and win. David had done all of this in his youth. I mean, this is before he's a king. He's killed lions and bears. I mean, the verse, it says that if if he went and he took on a lion and he takes the lamb from it, and if it turned against him, he grabbed it by the jaw and he killed it. Can any of you imagine doing that? I can't even believe that it, 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 I mean, that is an incredible thing. That's like Samson level. I mean, he just grabs it by the jaw and kills it. Now, He had to have an incredible confidence and faith in the Lord to be able to even try that. Very few people in this world would ever even try that, unless it's a last resort. But he was not anointed king until he was 30 years old, which actually, um, you know, this whole time until he's 30, 
he's growing in his faith. He's learning and he's he's experiencing God and he's living his faith out. And what's what's kind of interesting is that it's very similar to Jesus. If you um, if you look at, at Jesus's sort of time frame, he doesn't start his ministry until he's thirty years old either. Here's another interesting fact, actually, a correlation between David and Jesus is that David dies in nine hundred seventy BC. And Jesus dies somewhere, it's hard to know exact, but somewhere between 30 and 33 AD. Now, if you do the math, that's exactly a thousand years between his death and Jesus' death. A thousand years. It's an interesting fact because it's amazing how God works. God is not some, you know, uh, people often think that God is some like chaotic, um, I don't know, universe messing around cosmic jester person, right? That just kind of makes people have all these horrible things happen or whatever else. People look at God like that all the time. But in reality, especially when you look at the scriptures, you can see that, that God is very well organized. And his plans are in place. And I would not be surprised that if there were not exactly a thousand years between the moment that David died and the moment that Christ died. Because God's just that good. God's just that crazy and amazing. See, David's story of faith, I, I do think it teaches us something. It's that faith in God requires a childlike dependence on Him. Not that we're supposed to be childish in our faith, but childlike in the sense that we, we look to Him for everything. For guidance, for whatever we need in our life. And we don't often do that. Because as adults, we've grown up, haven't we? We can take care of ourselves. We make money so that we can provide for our own shelter and all of these things. And that often blinds us to a childlike faith that relies completely on the Lord instead of on ourselves. But if we can have that childlike faith, you know what comes with it? A confidence to take on giants. A confidence to take on things, whatever things, that would come at us in this world because we know that God is with us. And that's where we want to live. We want to live where David was living in that moment when he took on the Philistine. That he had so much confidence in the Lord that he was angry that nobody else did. And that he was eager to meet this giant. He ran toward it. And he knew that God was with him and he took it on. Because his faith in the Lord had given him a confidence to take on giants. And we may never fight a huge Philistine, and I hope we never do. <laughs> but we will fight incredible odds in our lives. We will face literal or metaphorical giants in our lives. We will. Things are going to come against us because, you know, the closer you grow to the Lord, the more you're going to be attacked. The more that comes at you, the more, the more obstacles fly in our way. And we have to face these odds. But when we continue to grow in our relationship with the Lord and, and, and seek that childlike faith and our confidence grows, we can face those things. And we can face them eagerly. We can run toward them like David did. But I hope that, that hearing this, this story of faith, it does call you into action. I hope that it, it, it inspires something within you. I hope that it ignites a flame, maybe. I hope that it strengthens you. I hope that it encourages you. And I hope that it guides you. And that, you know, we've all probably heard this story a million times, but I hope that for some reason, hearing it today grabs you in a new or maybe even a deeper way. And fires you up. Calls you to a childlike faith. But I hope it also reassures you of God's goodness. I mean, God is so good. God continues to bless us when we don't deserve it. And I hope that it ingrains this scripture into your brain. So that you can pull it up. You can remember it. You can think on this story. When you're in these situations. When you're facing a giant. And you got to take something on. Because we're all called to live by this kind of a faith. A childlike faith. Not an immature, childish faith, but a childlike faith that relies on the Lord. 
Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing uh, step by step. And you can come forward during this if you'd like to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and begin this crazy journey of faith that we're all embarking on together. Um, or if you want to uh, join, uh, transfer your membership to this place, we will welcome you at this time as well. Um, but will you please stand and we'll sing step by step. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me and i will follow you all of my days oh boom. that's okay we can in there <laughs> and so you know i just i just pray that each and every one of you would grow to have this childlike faith to understand what it means to truly rely on the lord to maybe not grow up in some ways amen And, and uh, just remember that we are going to continue to to collect candy. So not just this week, any week, all the way up until uh, Halloween. We're going to have that box back there. So. <laughs>